رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع دنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام يوم الدين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim the topic for this series of talks is sins or vices as means to enlightenment and growth and virtue as an introduction into this talk we will state straight off that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created us in order for us to fail Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us in order for us to succeed for us to come of age, for us to inherit the paradise. And it cannot be otherwise. If you look at the nature of human beings, through that we can gauge the nature of God. There is no truer gauge for the nature of God than the nature of human themselves. We as parents, as instructors, as heads of state, want the best from our children, from our student, from the community that we govern. We want least amount of people failing. And even those who fail, we want them to be rectified. The only reason we punish people is in order for them to reform and become better and contributing citizens of the community. And hence, that is the nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places within us and that by priority is the nature of Allah himself. He wants us to succeed and hence the emphasis within the spiritual literature, the Quran and otherwise that Allah forgives all sins, that Allah sends prophets relentlessly to guide, that these people of reform sacrifice all that they have in order to bring about the best that is there to be brought about within humanity. So the story is one of success and how we arrive at success. And in this introduction, I will also say <clears throat> that when we imprison people, we do so in order to rectify them and to protect them from further crimes. So the prisons are also a reformative place for reformation. And hence, if there's any other way to reform the people, the human mind would quickly want to explore that way. We cannot say that we should destroy a particular type of people because they are evil. For example, the ISIS, destroy them because they are evil. Humanity will create a few more. That is not the solution. It's an immediate solution. It's not a long-term solution. The Blessed Prophet went to a community of beast-like, monstrous people. He brought out the best in them, and that too through a process of 23 years of preaching. So we are a success story. Straight off, we need to understand that. Whatever is there within this world is geared towards us coming of age and becoming a success and coming to that point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rejoices and takes pride in. You've heard that story. That nothing gives Allah more joy than a person who reforms. The hadith says that I feel more joy at receiving my lost servant than you feel in finding your lost animal. Of course, it was framed and phrased in accordance with the mentality 
of the day. So now sins are as ugly as they are, as bad and as evil as they are. They need to be understood. Our understanding of sins at times is inaccurate and it's leading to a further state of regression. Look at the Blessed Prophet. He saw things very, very differently. He said, these are humans. They are weak. They need to be encouraged to do good. We have seen this, that when a child is unruly and when we reprimand the child, at times it fails and they lose all confidence in themselves and they become more unworthy within their own souls and as a result they transgress even further. But on the other hand, sometimes we try a different approach with the child and we tell the child that you know what, you can do so much, you've got such a lot of good in you, such a lot of potential in you and accept the little good that the child has and immediately that brings about reformation to no end. That word of encouragement brings about reform to an extent we could not imagine. This is our understanding of this life of ours. That it's a very positive life. It is geared towards us becoming a success. The eventual end of God on the face of this earth is to bring about a glorious state of humanity. When the angels protested and they said he will create mischief, corruption and bloodshed in the land, Allah said, even then, let him. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had full confidence that through a turbulent path that him and that this and his progeny will come through, they will come of age. They will represent the glorious truth vested within them at some point. And for that, I can take the trouble of seeing them destroy as much as they destroy. But eventually they'll come off, uh, they will come off age. The same is the anticipation of a teacher and of a parent. So God is no different. Now, the Prophet said that the thing that broke the devil's back was the door of repentance. That Allah said, I have left the door of repentance open for you. Now you need not feel that you are damned and condemned. You can make the switch at any point, at any moment. Now, having said this, we embark on our talks. What is sin? What is vice? Is it an act? Is it a trait? Is it both? What have the spiritual masters said about this? What does the Quran say about this? What does the Prophet say about this? What is the human soul? What is actually happening to us in this world? How do we then understand damnation and salvation? What is the meaning of sin? How can the sin be analyzed and used as a growth property? Something that is so dark can become the point for the creation of utmost light. You can see straight off that it is intriguing you, at least I can see that from your expressions. And if you are not in that way, then recite salawat. Uh, nonetheless, recite salawat. So we come to this notion of good and evil, khair and shar. Khair and shar. And we want to work through this in the next five days. Well, what is khair? What is shar? What is good? What is evil? How do we understand these things? And in the context of that, how do we place sins and good deeds and what is happening to us? So immediately we say that shar, evil, is an unbefitting state. It is unbefitting because it is unproductive. And good is a befitting state because it is productive. Now, how are they productive and unproductive is something we will work through. So in the context of evil, what is sin? What do we understand by sin? If we look at our religion, sin is constituted by disobedience to the command of God. The command of God, on the other hand, is not an arbitrary command. The command of God 
is something that is in line with our nature of existence. So if God says, do not steal, and we steal, we have committed an act of sin. What does that mean? What that means is that stealing damages us, damages a society, and it is counterproductive. So then, if sin is that, then what if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not prohibited something and it is still damaging? Does that constitute a sin or not? It will have the negative impact on the society, on the self. But does that constitute a sin or not? In one sense, it is a wrong act which is detrimental. It brings about regression within the soul. But on the other hand, is it sin because I have not gone against the command of God? The answer is, what do you think God would say to you at this point despite him not saving, saying anything about it previously? The answer would be, God would prevent me from it because if it's wronging me and wronging somebody else, then that would then constitute a sin. But we can see a distinction that, but I have done this wrong act, not knowing that God prohibited it. So I'm not transgressing against God in that way. I'm transgressing against my own soul. I'm transgressing against somebody else, but I'm not transgressing against God. From here we can say that this person is delusional, but there might be a point here. Because the Prophet said, إِنَّمَا amalu bin niyat that the deeds are in accordance with intentions. If a person commits an act of wrong, but the intention of wronging is not there, firmly fixed, then is it as wrong? The answer appears to be no, it is wrong, and yet it is not as wrong. So here we understand the intention that accompanies an act inevitably is the measure of that act. If a person has an evil intent and then commits an act of wrong, then that act of wrong is a very grave act of wrong. Whereas if a person commits an act of wrong, without that intention that accompanies it, it is wrong nonetheless, but it is not wrong of that caliber. So what happens internally is actually determining the nature of the act that is being performed outside. It is here that we find this statement of Imam Zunul Abidin most pertinent, in which he states, O oh Allah, I have sinned, I know that. But my sins, O oh Lord, have been due to my weakness. And I admit that those sins have an impact upon me and I'm regretful for that. And I'm remorseful for those acts. However, O oh Allah, none of these sins were committed in order to undermine you. They were not in my heart a violation of your sanctity. And you know that, O oh Allah, I've done wrong and I bear the consequences of those wrongs. But none of them were done with that intention that you are not worthy of obedience. They were done in a moment of weakness. So a sin is an act that is wrong, that has bad effects. But what affects the human soul profoundly is an intention that accompanies that act. And hence the Prophet said, niyat." that the deeds are in accordance with the intentions. Straight off, we are beginning to see that sin has got something intimately to do with attitudes and character. Which then brings us to this distinction that the Quran is giving and that our Sufi masters are always talking about. As Rumi says, O oh you who consume alcohol. No, he says, O oh you who prays prayers. I'm paraphrasing him. I don't know what he said exactly now verbatim, so I'm paraphrasing him, obviously. Well, I am an Arif after all, right? Salawat. He says, O oh, you who pray, 
and curse the one who consumes alcohol. Do you not see the real sin of all sins? Is that hatred residing deep within your heart? That state of uncare towards another, non-regards for the sacredness of God, do you not see that that is the sin of all sins and mother of all sins? The act of consumption of alcohol means nothing compared to the sin that you are committing despite adhering to your prayers and fasting your fasts. So the real sin is what the soul is becoming. The act is weighed in accordance with that. So the trait of the soul is the real state of sin. When the soul becomes regressive, Oh, when the soul becomes darkened, and as I said, we will work into these things, then that in the spiritual literature is known as the real sin. A person laughingly does something wrong without understanding the gravity of what they are doing and without wanting to undermine the sanctity of God is like a child committing an act of wrong. But a person who realizes full well that this act is being watched by my God who is seeing me at present and then still commits that act of wrong then such an act its gravity of evil cannot be measured because it's violating the right and the sanctity of God from here we understand that what is virtue therefore is it a mere act is it the act of giving charity is it praying Salah or is it the intention that accompanies it? The answer is both are virtues. But the second one with intention is surely a virtue whereas the first one may not be. And hence the Prophet has said at some point that make an intention of doing good even if it does not result in a good action. For that intention in itself brings about goodness within the soul which is rewardable. What does this say? That intending good brings about a characteristic, a trait of good. And that is what we are concerned with. We are talking about the inner state of good and the inner state of evil, where the actions later on that are committed are a mere manifestation of that inner state. And therefore, by contrast, goodness is that which resides within the heart and naturally produces the act of goodness. So here it is. <coughs> Caring for another to the extent of wanting to sacrifice what one has and then extending the hand in the way of God is known as an act of charity from within the soul. Whereas giving something in charity for the sake of a habitual state of giving, nonetheless will constitute a good deed, but in essence it is deprived of the property of good character being there. So we begin to see that the evil deed and the good deed externally are mere manifestations of what goes on within. If the good deed is accompanied by good being, then that is indeed a weighty good thing. If an evil deed is accompanied by an evil being, then that is indeed an evil thing that we are bringing out because it is there firm within us. Now let's flip this. If a person has an evil tendency <coughs> but does not commit an evil act, then that brings about a state of a good deed. If a person has the tendency of lying, but does not lie and restrains himself, is that prevention of evil only or does that constitute good? That evil tendency is a means for utmost good because that restrainment for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing about inner reformation. Despite having the utmost impulse to do wrong, if a person does not do wrong, 
then that constitutes an utmost good deed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on that day, every atom's weight of good and evil will be seen. That good and evil that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about on the day of Qiyamah is the good and evil that is accompanied through the state of the heart. I'll tell you why. Imagine, if a monster like Saddam appears before God. Now Saddam is a bad example. Let's, exp- let's, let's just take somebody who is a bad person, but has done a lot of charity, and has done a lot of prayers, and has done a lot of fast, and has done a lot of hajj. Why did they do all of these things? Because they understood in this world that if I fast, and if I pray, and if I do hajj, that gives me a lot of points. And they will balance off my negative points on the day of Qiyamah. But at the same time, they are stealing. They are not concerned about others. They are angry people. They are greedy. They are lustful. (coughs) Now on the day of Qiyamah, such a person will go to paradise. According to this understanding. But the person's heart is a sick heart. Is the scale a reflection of the quantity or the quality of deeds that are on there? Did the blessed prophet not say that two rakats prayed genuinely for the sake of Allah are better than many rakats prayed without the sense of God? Did the blessed prophet not say if you give me two rakats prayed sincerely I will give you paradise? I mean, he, him or his family has said that somewhere. But it makes sense, doesn't it? That it is the quality, not the quantity. From here we begin to see that actually sin and good deed are inner states of being. And every good deed and every evil deed that will be seen on the day of Qiyamah will be seen in accordance with the intentions that accompanied them. So a person, despite having the ability to do wrong, if they restrain themselves, then that will constitute a good deed. Whereas if a person, let's say somebody has this evil tendency, which we will talk about in the next few days, and then acts in accordance with it, then what happens? then that evil tendency becomes a firm disposition within the soul. And at that point, the act just reinforces that evil tendency within. Whereas going against it, going against it, may be able to remove that evil tendency and might be able to rectify it. Now, we have this hadith that on the day of Qiyamah, The Prophet said people will be raised in forms of animals. Snakes and ants and goats and donkeys and pigs. So they asked the Prophet why. The Prophet said in accordance with the tendencies of their souls shall they be raised. So if a person is very lustful, they will be raised presumably as pigs. Whereas somebody who is very angry will be raised as a dog or a Rottweiler or some mad dog. Not taking nothing away from the dog, it's a beautiful creature of God. But for a human being to become a dog is not praiseworthy. I'm just covering my back with the animal rights campaigners. So why is this then? What happens there is (coughs) that many good souls who are doing good deeds in the worldly estimation appear to be animals within the hereafter. Because the good deed was not an outcome of that deep-seated, beautiful intention and it did not create a good disposition from within. And whereas other people who have committed evil deeds but their souls have been very, very pure, they will be raised as human beings. And Kitabul Mu'min, there's a hadith from Imam Adi Salamullah in which he says that people on the day of Qiyamah embarrassingly will look at the throne of God and they will say to God, our books bear no sign of our sins. 
And these are the people who will be asking about the acts of sin against God and against their souls. The response will come that my state of dignity cannot withstand that other than me should look upon your sins. And that is what Imam Ali Salamullah says about, uh, about the two angels <coughs> that accompany us. He says, oh Allah, forgive me those sins that you have concealed from your angels as well. And the reason why Allah conceals them from his angels is because Allah feels a sense of embarrassment that the angels should not look at them. This all goes to show that the act is not as problematic as the intention that accompanies it. That the real point of sin is that trait that is within. The real point of a good deed is the creation of that good state inside the soul. Now I'm going to skip a, 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 a few things here because I don't have uh, much time before the lecture finishes today. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, every soul knows of good and evil deep from within. The soul and the one who has leveled it or balanced it and inspired it with its good and its evil. We can recall the first time when we did something wrong, <coughs> maybe unknowingly as children, maybe the first time when we stole something or lied and that feeling of unease and discomfort that came in there and we couldn't explain it. Why is this happening to me? That is a gauge, an inner gauge for what is good and what is evil. The only problem is that when we do not pay heed to that inner intuitive voice, that that becomes diminished and it stops talking with us. Yet the opportunity is still there to rectify things that we will talk about, inshallah. The Blessed Prophet was asked, how do I know what is good? So see, this person, and how do I know what is evil? He asked the Prophet. So this person did not presume that prayer is good, that lying is bad. He did not presume any of these things. He genuinely wanted to know a yardstick beyond what the Quran says of do's and don'ts. So the Blessed Prophet said, he said, evil is that which brings about discomfort within the soul. For that you feel a sense of embarrassment within. He said, no matter how people justify it to be right, that is evil. He said, good is that that brings about a wholesome feeling from within. No matter how much people tell you, it is otherwise. So he gave that yardstick that good and evil <coughs> actually are inner states. The good deed and the evil deed are valued only in accordance with the intentions that are accompanying them. And a good deed reinforces that beautiful good trait. And if it does not reinforce it, then that's not a good deed at all. Think about this. Imam Ali Salamullah was asked, how do I know that my prayers are accepted? And I often repeat this. It's in the Quran. Inna as yanha anil fahsha wal munkar. Inna as tanha anil fahsha wal munkar. That the salah takes you away from that which is indecent and that which is reprehensible. So the Imam said, in order for that Salah to be classified as a good deed, it has to have its positive effects on you. Effects on what? Effects on the soul and the mind. And if it does not have it, then that's not a good deed. So similarly, we can see the opposite. <coughs> that an evil deed is one that creates that unbefitting state of the heart and the mind. And it is here we begin to understand that one person misses their prayer and they are still good. 
Another one misses their prayer and they are evil. That one obviously does not have that intention that I value my sleep more than remembrance of God. And this one obviously has this understanding that my sleep and comfort should not be valued beyond God and he still values it beyond God. So that constitutes a real sin, whereas that one does not constitute a sin of that level. Salawat. Sorry. Thank you so much. So sins or vices and good deeds, virtues are inner states in the most accurate sense. However, the Quran has said that in al hasanat yudhibna as or to the, uh, that the good deeds take away evil deeds. What he's trying to say here is that when you find evil within yourself, the inner state, try and do as much good as possible. For they, they will wipe out the evil from within. What that will do is, it will replace one disposition with another disposition. One trait with another trait. So if a person is greedy, if they can excessively start giving and caring for others, the greed will be an opportunity for bringing about utmost good. And the curious and the odd thing is that it is only people <coughs> who can be very evil have the, have the opportunity and the potential of being very, very good. And it is only the people who are very, very good who have the opportunity of becoming very, very evil. So when a person finds the states of evil within themselves, they are to see them as opportunities and not to frown upon them or curse them, but to see them as things that they can use positively. These are like uncut diamonds. Now, we come to the sin and the trait of sin. See, we have these two notions in our spiritual literature that come out. One is istighfar, seeking forgiveness, and one is toba. When we go to Arafah, we are told that Allah forgives every sin. And the biggest sin on the day of Arafah is to assume that Allah has not forgiven us. This is what Imam Sadiq said, to think that Allah has not forgiven you after promising you, to, uh, promising you forgiveness is the greatest sin. So Allah forgives every sin on the day of Arafah because we do istighfar. We remember our evil deeds and we do istighfar. What we don't understand is that Allah has cleaned the slate. What cannot be done on the day of Arafah is the operation of the mind and the soul. There is a cancer within. That cancer is oozing out a tumor. That tumor is cleansed from the surface. <coughs> but it's going to ooze it again. We need to understand that Allah SWT has forgiven individual sins, but the tendency to sin is still there. And the tendency to sin is something that we need to address. And hence we have this notion of Toba. My time has finished for today. But think about this phenomenal hadith of the Blessed Prophet. The Blessed Prophet said that a sin after which there is reform is more pleasing to me than a good deed after which there is conceit. Think of this hadith. When do we want to grow and reform? When do we have this notion of reformation? Only when we understand that there is some lack within us. Yes? <coughs> Only when there is that humility that we have to reform. One of the markers of lack is sin. If we did not sin, we would lose the opportunity of growth altogether. 
There is another hadith of the Prophet in which he says that if the son of Adam were to stop sinning, Allah would destroy him or destroy them and create another species who would sin so that Allah may forgive. What does that mean? That sin is actually an awakener. It is something that tells us that there is a lack within us, that breaks our state of arrogance, that brings us back to that state of wanting to evolve and grow and become better. But if there is no sin, there is no notion of further growth and we defeat the whole purpose of existence and life goes to waste. Sin in that way is the greatest gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if understood. Obviously not committing sins deliberately because then that would be a violation of the sanctity of God. But a sin when it is committed and inevitably we will commit sins whether we like it or not. Because we are created in the cradle of sin. The Blessed Prophet said, Shaitan flows in the bloodstreams of the children of Adam. You cannot get rid of the Shaitan. It's a constant struggle against the Shaitan and growing. So sin, after which there is reform. Why reform? Because the human soul has to reach the most elevated position of finding God. And how do they find God? until and unless they feel unworthy and humble within themselves. If they feel that they are complete, then they become stifled and arrogant. <coughs> Look at the devil. He was so accurate, so correct, so righteous, that that righteousness of his brought about conceit. That conceit caused him to defy the very object of his worship. Because I cannot be better than this. I am better than he is. You created me from fire, him from hell. Him from dust. I'll put you in hell. Be it. I'll take him in hell with me. Look at the reactions the Iblis is giving. The good deed of Iblis resulted in conceit. It stifled Iblis. And the very one towards whom he was growing... He became an enemy of that same God. Not only enemy, but his ardent enemy. That I will not only go to hell, I don't care if you put me to hell, I'll go to hell, I'll take them all with me. In defiance. But here is sin. If Iblis at that point, when he committed that sin, could have introspected, and said, O oh Allah, indeed I have become arrogant. Forgive me. He would have humbled himself and Adam would have been told to prostrate in front of Iblis. That is how supreme this person or this entity could have been. So a sin after which there is reform is dearer to me than a good deed after which there is conceit. What we take from today is this, that sins are expected of human beings. They will happen whether we like it or not. But sins should not be deliberate, should not be accompanied by an intention. Let them be accidental. And if somebody has the tendency of sinning due to a trait, then let them restrain themselves because that act of restraining is leading to inner reform and a great deal of inner growth. And three, that sin is an opportunity. It's the greatest opportunity that we can have. It is like a student failing a test from which the student learns a test that ensures that he passes the final exam. A sin should be seen as an opportunity. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when a lost soul comes to me, I feel the greatest joy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you walk to me, I shall run to you. If you advance to me, I shall open my arms and embrace you. These are obviously expressions. So sin is actually that moment of realization that we need to get back with God. And then to thank him, to say, had it not been for that sin, I would have not arrived at this deep-seated understanding and realization that I need to turn back to you. <clears throat> we have the example of Hazrat Hur in front of us. Look at the way Imam Hussein understands things so brilliantly. When Hur came, Imam Hussein said to him, not only I, but my Lord has forgiven you. What Imam Hussein was saying here was, that the person who committed a crime against me is no longer there. That person has changed into this beautiful angel that is before me today. How can I curse you? How can I punish you? How can I blame you when you are not even you yourself? You did what you did. You introspected. You repented. You reformed. Today you are a different person. Just imagine. From somebody leading the grandson of the blessed prophet, the king of the youth of paradise, the light of God on the face of earth, from somebody who leads that person into the mouth of death and becoming worthy of the wrath of God, to somebody today who becomes a beacon of hope, an icon for humanity, a saint of all saints, and the father of free man, as Hussein called him, that you are free in this world and in the hereafter. That is when we humble ourselves through the act of sin and bring about reformation from within. <clears throat> This is the night in which we obviously make a mention of our dear lady Sakina or Ruqayya in accordance with the Hadith literature. We find her narration in several places within the Maqatil. The first is when she is in the lap of her father. And she says to her father, O oh father, where do you go? And he said to bring some water back for you. And she says, Oh Father, I am no longer thirsty. My uncle Abbas went and he did not come back. I fear at least you will go and not come back. We find her again, dismayed, standing in front of Zuljana. O oh, steed of my father, why is your saddle turned? Why does your mane drip of blood? O oh, Zuljana, where have you left my father? Did they give him a drop of water? Or did they behead him upon a burning thirst? Then we see this child with her garments on fire. Her face turned blue and black and her face covered with dripping blood. We see her again on the 11th of Muharram upon the torn body and in the embrace of her father, sleeping peacefully only to be awoken by a cracking whip upon her little back. She flutters and trembles We see her again asking in the ruins of Sham, O oh, aunt, where is my father? 
Where is Akbar, my brother? Where is Abbas, my uncle? They have gone away and they shall return and come and fetch you again, O child. On a night she calls out for her father. And her father appears to her. And she awakens and cries out for her father. Send her the head of her father. When she looked at the wounded face of her father, she said, Oh man, who are you? Then she says, Oh father, it is you. Why are you so wounded, O oh father? Why is your body, your head detached from your body, O oh father? She cries and falls silent. This is how the child of Hussein is lost in the ruins of Sham. Imam Sajjad said, The grief and the mother of all grief was when I laid my little sister to rest. For the wounds of her body were so deep that they had become her garment. ولا لعنة ولا القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة Can we recite Amma Yujib five times for all those who are sick and unwell? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه يكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه يكشف السوء Thank you Sheikh for that thought provoking lecture um, Just a couple of announcements before we end So we'll be having a Q&A session with Sheikh Arif this Sunday after the lecture have any questions from tonight's lecture or any other? Uh, if you have any questions from tonight's lecture or from any of the coming lectures, you can send them via our website www.almahdi.edu forward slash 2019 or you can send them on Facebook. To improve the quality of our public lectures, we have feedback forms available at the entrance. Um, so it be great if you could um, complete these as critically as possible. Um, also due to popular demand, we now have a card machine in the entrance as well. So if you'd like to donate for the lecture series. Tomorrow night's program starts at 7.30 p.m. with the Wai Kumail, um, followed by the lecture and ending with refreshments. Um, can we please recite a final surah for all marhumin al-fatah? <laughs>